Great. Uh, thank you so much um, for coming out today. I thought I would start by briefly connecting what I'm about to do to my intro talk that I gave on Monday. So on Monday, I presented an econometrics paper and I argued that there are cases where we may want to model decision-making based on data, specifically estimation um, by uh, an agent who I call the researcher in a setting where there may be conflicts of interest around that. So I motivated that by the idea that sometimes when we estimate uh, a quantity, we may not be disinterested, but we may care about producing a specific result. And that may lead to concerns um, around p-hacking or in general concerns around the estimate we provide, not just, um, not just showing some underlying truth, but also revealing some preferences that we have around it. And so the basic model that I used for that is I basically went to mechanism design and I said, okay, there are results in mechanism design that we can use to model these settings where we model that as an interaction between the researcher who is the agent in that model and a principal who is the designer who may have some, uh, may be able to put some constraint on that estimation. So that could, for example, be the editor of a journal. Um, and so the way that I wrote it is that the agent has some loss function um, but then also may have some private information, which I captured by this idea that the agent has informative prior about the world. While the principal here um, may have some belief about um, that information, but doesn't actually know it and wants to delegate the decision by putting some constraints on that agent. Um, and so what I want to do today is I want to use a similar model, but use a similar model to approach the regulation of AI. Um, and so the underlying idea is that actually in, in what I showed you guys, there wasn't just an agent who then took that decision, but I also argued that that agent actually may then want to use something like a machine learning algorithm. So something like a um, an underlying technology that basically um, solves a prediction problem. So that actually there's a third layer here where there's an algorithm that optimally we hope basically estimates um, a prediction function that minimizes some loss in a way that is minimizing expected auto sample loss and practically most, uh, most um, often is implemented by some empirical risk minimization where Levitt uh, choose some function that minimizes empirical risk in my sample. And where we hope to not just find an alignment in this case between the principal and the researcher, but also where that researcher um, tries to come up with basically a machine learning problem that also aligns with what their goal is. So it's just on a very high level, I think that alignment idea, you know, doesn't just um, apply to the idea that there may be a, um, a journal editor and a researcher submitting something, but also to the idea that when we implement some algorithms, we may also be interested in modeling this as a question of alignment of basically whether whatever goal we have when we come up with an estimator is aligned with um, whatever the underlying algorithm does uh, that solves some prediction problem for us. And then often the goal is that we basically find a prediction problem and we find a mapping from the output of that prediction problem to our estimator that ensures that effectively whatever estimator we get lies in a nice uh, class of estimators. So in my case, that was the class of unbiased estimators. So I asked, how can we design a mechanism so that the machine learning algorithm that we use always leads to an unbiased estimator? And then hopefully we also hope that it provides efficiency, which basically means that whatever problem the machine learning algorithm solves for us leads to a solution that is doing well at the loss function that we care about. Sorry, so this is like very, very high level, um, the way that I think about uh, how we can uh, basically bring together ideas from delegation and mechanism design and the use of kind of um, estimators in econometrics, but um, more specifically machine learning. Um, so I wanted to briefly mention that because I didn't get to it at the end of, of my last lecture, but I want to point out that I think this view on modeling um, data-driven decisions and econometric decisions and a principal agent view, I think it, it unifies a few um, ways that different disciplines have approached conflicts of interest in data-driven decision-making. I used that in my talk on Monday to talk about ideas of robust um, machine learning, the um, robust integration of machine learning into causal inference and specifically design of pre-analysis plans. It was also very related to other uh, lines of literatures that we've heard about over the course of the week, including strategic classification, where we may have um, multiple objectives, um, the question of when AI is aligned, um, other topics that have been dealt with in the economics literature, like manipulation proof machine learning. Um, and today, what I want to do is I want to give another example where we use principal agent modeling in conjunction 
with data-driven decision-making and specifically talk about the regulation of AI. Um, and so that's going to be talked today. But just want to pause here and see whether any comments or questions on this very big picture view. So the main example you mentioned is mm -hmm. public chains and edit them. Mm -hmm. But do you really think they would ever use such a machine learning algorithm or do you think that there are like some of them? You mean whether the in practice we would use the machine learning algorithm for this yeah. yeah. So I do think so. I, I do think that there will be, you know, I do think that researchers submit to editors like some work where there's some machine learning algorithm was used in, in the underlying world, but maybe not mechanically, right? Like not. So I don't think there's the machine learning algorithm that does something automatically and then you just look at the output, but it's usually within some carefully controlled procedure, which I would argue in my framework would mean that you've tried to um, use a procedure where you have some guarantees about that the output of the machine learning algorithm is actually not, um, not creating any bias, for example. So I, I do think that that's the case, but the examples I have in mind today is for example, a company using an algorithm to do credit scoring but a regulator being nervous about the fairness properties of it. So that's the kind of example of mine. Does it? Yeah, yeah. That's a question. Okay. I think I like that second example. Because you, you're more worried about the machine learning algorithm doing your causal inference strategy. The first example. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So then I'm glad I'm talking about the second one, not the first one today. Is it? Yeah, so just in the, in, feel free to ignore it. Yeah. It, this doesn't matter. Feel free to not answer it. But I guess in just the high level overview you gave, I'm a little confused about the mm -hmm. relationship between a hat and cow hat. Um, in this one, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what I mean, okay, so maybe it, this this was like just trying to structure some thoughts about the structure of what I what I showed on Monday. So um the idea here is that so this is the, the structure we looked at to, um on Monday. Like yeah. there's a principle, there's an agent we may have. But then I also argued the agent may actually want to use a machine learning algorithm, or in general, I would say some algorithm that solves some econometric problem, because it's not like the agent, you know, chooses that estimator by hand in a way, but instead uses some technology. And I, what my argument here is that we can also model a relationship of that technology to the goal of, of the researcher in a similar way. So the idea here was that the mapping from the effort from the underlying prediction function to the treatment effect, maybe something like I use a machine learning algorithm to residualize. Well, I assume you're doing something like double machine learning, you may be using multiple underlying solutions to risk minimization problems, and then you're plugging them into a procedure. But that procedure is chosen in a way that I know that whatever estimate I get out of it has some nice properties. So lands within the class of estimators I like. So, so in so what I did in my nuisance parameter and stuff. Right. So, uh, so if you want to, to see the uh, semi parametric estimation, I'm saying there may be some nuisance parameters that solve some underlying risk minimization problem. Mm -hmm. And we can see some analogs to mechanism design and delegation by saying that is has similar structure to the idea that in mechanism design, the algorithm here would be an agent that just minimizes that loss function. That's all we know about it. How can we use an output to that? in the sense that we want to use it in a way that is robust, meaning that whatever that output is, it lands within the class of estimators we want. And at the same time aligned, meaning that if my agent, which is the algorithm is good at doing that, then the property of my estimator is better. So that's how I think about it, kind of from a very, very big picture. Yeah. But I, I didn't, you know, like, didn't provide a very clean example of this. I do think the procedure I showed on Monday around the idea that we can use something for risk minimization and then plug that into a basically a residualization approach to get an average treatment effect and use sample splitting to avoid bias is an example of something like that, where I can show formally that we have robustness in the sense that no matter what that algorithm does, we're still unbiased. But I also have benefits from alignment, meaning if that algorithm is actually good at solving that with minimization problem, then I also get a better estimator in the sense that it is has a lower variance, which will translate to lower um, to a lower loss for me, because I care about that variance. So it kind of provides a, an example of an alignment. And I think my argument is that more broadly, we can actually see which tools allow us to solve problems like that, because mechanism design has been thinking about very similar problems. Right? So what my paper is spelling out pretty explicitly here with this question of verifiability. Right? So there's things in some that the principal can check and things that they cannot check. Yeah. Um, I think that's, so yeah. Which seems kind of at the heart really of what's defining what the problem here is. So you're saying, so in a talk today, yeah, I think it's going to be very, 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 very
Yeah, so in, in what I said here, I'm kind of trusting that the algorithm at least, you know, attempts to solve that problem for me. But I agree with you, um, uh, also going back to Martin's comment, right? Like we may want to know a little bit more about what exactly the algorithm does and when this fails. Other than to say, oh, this algorithm was built to solve a problem for me, I may want to know more about how it goes about solving that. And so I'm going to talk more about that today in the in the context regulation. So I think that will make it a bit more clear. All right. So that's um, on, on a very big picture. I just wanted to mention that because I, while I, I don't think that the way I presented this now is like fully fleshed out, I do think there is some benefit to seeing those connections and trying to leverage um, leverage them. So with that said, maybe let me give go into the very very concrete application for today, which is um, work that I have with uh, two colleagues in finance. So Laura, who is at Stanford GSB, and Scott, who is at Chicago Booth, and which um, tries to model the interaction between a regulator and a uh, company. So typically, we think of a bank giving loans and tries to understand um, how we can use principal agent models here to talk meaningfully of regulation. So the context, and so because we set norms for questions, I'm very happy for you guys to interrupt me at any point. So this is designed as an econ talk, meaning um, if you don't ask questions, they're gonna be done in 45 minutes. <laughs> and if you're gonna ask questions, it's gonna take me two hours. So yeah. this is standard. Um, so this uh, paper is motivated by the observation that we increasingly use algorithms in high stakes decision-making such as medical testing, hiring, or lending, but then in many of those cases, there are actually conflicts of interest between um, those who deploy those algorithms and those who may have an interest in what they do. So specifically, there could be incentive conflicts in medical testing between an insurance company that is worried about over-testing and a hospital that uses an algorithm to decide who should get assigned to testing. Or in hiring, there may be an employer who cares about a diverse workforce and a hiring manager who may be um, using an algorithm that is driven by, say, past hiring decisions that may not fully reflect that goal um, of achieving a diverse workforce. On lending, and that's the example for today because I can show you some data where we apply this uh, on real-world credit data, um, there could be a financial regulator who is concerned about disparate impact or of systematic risk in the provision of loans. Um, and so in these contexts, in principle, the move from kind of humans taking decision to there being automated decision rules, um, so I, the decisions taken by algorithm in principle has one big advantage, which is I'm replacing something that's extremely hard to describe mathematically um, and to probe by something that is in principle a um, algorithm that I can inspect and that I can try out before it even gets deployed. But at the same time, this ability to provide effective oversight is complicated by the fact that many of these algorithms are extremely complex in that they are described by a large number of parameters that I can't um, fully grasp easily. And that has led to basically calls um, for simplicity and transparency of these algorithms, typically around the idea that I either can somehow explain what this algorithm can do in relatively simple terms, or that I even restrict the algorithm to be fully transparent meaning that I can fully describe the algorithm at the cost that I'm not allowed to, to use the most complex algorithms I could com um, possibly come up with. Um, and in this project, what we're basically asking is, in a principal agent model that actually explicitly models these incentive conflicts here, can we say something about those trade-offs between complexity and ability to provide oversight and, and say something about how we should think about effectively mitigating incentive conflicts and when these algorithms are too complex uh, to be fully understand by the regulator in, in our model. So the starting point for that is that complexity of the algorithms means that we assume that the agent cannot describe the full algorithm to the regulator. So some information will be lost in the agent translating in, um, information or transmitting information about that algorithm. That could be because the agent doesn't want to fully reveal that technology because it may be proprietary technology, or it may simply be because it's so complex that a regulator wouldn't be able to fully understand it, even if she had access um, to the full algorithm. And in that context, we consider two main policy options. The first policy options, uh, option would be that we simply limit the agent to only use a very simple algorithm that is fully transparent, meaning that um, there is no gap in information about what the algorithm does between the agent and the regulator. <clears throat> 
the definition of simple. Or... So later on, I'm going to say that I'm going to say that there's some information constraint about how much the regulator can understand. And simple would be that I'm restricting myself to algorithms where that information constraint allows for transmission of the full information. Like an entropy sense. So I'm going to think about, for example, the concrete implementation we're going to have in a data later is the um, regulator can only understand a simple proxy model of what you're doing. So say a linear projection of what you're doing. And then a simple model that would be fully transparent is I'm only using linear functions because I can understand them fully. I'm not allowed to use something that cannot be represented by fully by the linear proxy model. Yeah. Um, in, in practice, these AI models, if you pick up the random seed, they, they really do give the same answer every time you interrogate with the same input. Um, so you could just take 100,000 random inputs uh, and record their answers. Is, is that, that be covered as, a, as one of the ways in which you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking of one of the interpretations you could have here is that, yes, I'm like querying the algorithms at a few points. But I'm only able to query a limited number of points and not every point. Yeah. Because in principle, in order to describe everything that the algorithm does, you don't have any restrictions on its complexity. You would have to basically have seen every possible point in order to make your judgment. I'm assuming that it's only going to be possible to get a limited amount of information. For example, as kind of one example of a projection, you're kind of projecting what the algorithm does on only um, learning about the values of like 100 selected households that you apply it to in order to see what it would do. Yeah, yeah. So that's a kind of one example for restriction I have in mind. Yeah. Um, I just thought, do you think the first quality option will be equal in practice? But, you know, it might be the... Oh, I, I, do think, I do think the first policy option is what many banks currently doing. They are basically still using, so for credit scoring, some logistic regression based thing, just because that's what they've already been, always been doing. And so they have established procedures with the regulator of how to explain what they're doing. Now, whether that formally is kind of simple enough to be fully understood, I think that's a good question. I, I do think we often have this illusion that like a simple decision tree or a simple logistic regression is easy to understand. But I think even like a logistic regression with 10 variables, I would have problems understanding the implications that has. And that said, I do think that currently we are in an equilibrium where in some high risk cases, um, Especially banks, for example, rely on relatively simple models that the regulators used to because they're too nervous about what happens once they move to something fully non-parametric. And the question is exactly how to what, what to require of those more complex ones. So that's very much what motivates our study here. Max? Like an alternative way to think about the whole thing, right? Would be to, to not try to communicate the algorithm itself or the model, but instead just say, here's our prediction objective, here are the input data, here's our R squared or whatever measure of performance in some sense that's that captures the, the essence of what you would care about as a regulator more than the specific model um so i, I agree with you i think there are a few things that fall outside of what i'm proposing today but maybe complementary to it um so we are going to focus on basically saying you have this rule you know with which you take the decision so say that's a credit score and I want to describe what the credit score does in order to understand whether it has properties that I'm okay with as a regulator. I don't think that you telling me these are the steps I went through and here's my R squared would be quite enough because we assume that the regulator may care about additional statistics like disparate impact. So maybe we could amend that and say, maybe it would be enough to also give you information about disparate impact. So I do think one way would be to rely on, on kind of these summary statistics. I do think what I'm going to say applies in one way. The one way in which it applies is in all of those cases, you're still relying on a limited amount of information about the prediction function. So for example, in your case in R squared and some simple description of what, how, how it came to be. So I still see this as a some, somewhat information compression, but I do think there are policy tools that are not going to be available in my model. Like for example, um, those that evaluate, um, that you know rely on, um, restrictions on a procedure by which you've come up with the data, like an inspection of the training data and so on. So I'm, I'm assuming that I'm just inspecting the final decisions. If that makes sense. Yeah, I guess, I guess it just means like there, there's many cases where the algorithm or model is incredibly complex, mm -hmm. but in some ways it doesn't really matter because I mean, again, like yeah, say you care about accurate predictions and disparate impact, then those are the two things you should report on and basically say what are you optimizing for. 
Right. But all of, and I, I think what I wanted to point out there, though, is that I, I think we have this view that there is one number that, for example, gives us disparate impact. But you have an algorithm that then gets deployed somewhere in the future. You don't exactly know how the future will look like. You may want to know how it does across a number of settings. Or you may want to know where this disparate impact comes from, because in litigation, you won't just say, oh, there's excess disparate impact. But you then the firm is going to say, yeah, but that's because, you know, the applicants look different this year. So I think there is more structure needed usually for those arguments. So we're trying to approximate it. I'm not going to say that we're going to capture this perfectly. Um, but I, I do agree with you that I think there is something to be said about sometimes you may feel comfortable about a process. But one argument why I'm not quite convinced by that is that even if you're the software engineer who built this like complex neural network, you may also want to know that it does something that is not totally unreasonable. You know how it was built. You put it into a big machine that minimized some empirical risk for you. And you hope that this is enough for you to say that it will work well. But you may actually want to make sure that you understand that its first order behavior is actually reasonable because you're worried that it's driven by some artifact in the data that you weren't aware of. So I do think the procedure in that sense is somewhat limited in that I think this principal agent even already applies to, I'm a software engineer and I use some algorithm to fit to the data and I still want to know something about it. And the question we're asking today is what is the thing that you want to know about it that you should particularly look for? So that that I this is why I I like the idea of understanding the procedure by which we got there. I'm not convinced that it's um, going to be sufficient in many applications. Um, my sense was in a lot of the discussion but don't have mm -hmm. that, that there's a distinction between uh, individual recourse, where like why was the decision made for me, and what would have had to be different mm -hmm. for a different decision versus evaluating among the aggregate where I want to know that's this increase in equality or yeah, I mean, so I, I can like we've been working with a uh, think tank in in DC, especially um, Laura as my co-author in this project has been working with them. I mean, there there are different regulatory objectives. I think the one that you mentioned about, you know, how does this, this was decision taken for me in the context of um, giving out credit usually takes the form of adverse action notice. So banks have to explain to you why you were rejected for a loan. And I think that's a different case that is not really well captured here. We are focusing on two regulatory objectives that are also there, which is one, is there an overall disparity produced by my algorithm? And a second, which is, is there overall excess risk? Because I'm worried that if I don't regulate how banks give out loans, they may not fully incorporate systemic um, externalities that they have. So meaning that if the uh, economy goes down, then they may have to be bailed out, which may not fully factor into their objective function, but I as a regulator care about. So I want to make sure that kind of loan provision still works well, even in a downturn. And so those are the two kind of more macro things we care about here, Isaiah? Yeah, no, I, I was just going to say, I mean, I'm, I think this is a very interesting conversation. I would like yeah. to have it in the context where I've seen what your objective functions yeah. are for the regulator. That makes sense. So uh, Do you I just want to add like about the first policy option, I'm thinking like maybe if you're regulating like the tech industry or something, um, the algorithms are all like super complex and there's no way you can like force a firm to use a simple algorithm because it would just be like, they'd be so much less competitive than all the other tech companies or something. I think that's I think that's totally fair. I mean, I'm gonna to argue today that this is a, a frequent thing that is called foreign policy discourse that I will, but I will show you data that basically suggests that it would be a bad idea here. Um okay, so let me actually therefore go to this, give you the overview, and then go into my concrete model so that we can ground this in, in the specifics that I can do here. So okay, what are we gonna do? We're gonna theoretically so so first of all, I think what I wanted to end up on here is to say, you know. And there's a second option, which is not just limiting to simple things, but instead saying, I let you take the complex choice, but I force you to give me some information about how your algorithm works in order to make a determination of whether I think that algorithm is okay. And then there is a question of how I do that. And you know, the machine learning um, literature has produced a lot of ideas of how I can produce simple descriptions of complex algorithms in terms of these are the key drivers of the output. This is how important they are. Sometimes also this is a direction of, of the, the impact. However, most of those are not motivated by some policy objective, but are motivated by some mathematical axioms that are not necessarily mapping to anything we care about in from a welfare or a principal agent sense. So our question today is like, can these kind of approaches of um, explaining complex model in a simple way, and um, how much does this help us in providing effective regulation? And how should we think about micro-founding the idea of explainability and when we think of it from an economic perspective. So that's kind of really the, the main question I want to um, propose 
an answer for today. Specifically, in a principal agent model, we make precise um, the role of explanations of complex machine learning models um, and then argue that in our empirical case, as well as suggested by the model, um, if we do um, use ex ante restrictions to simple full transparent functions, we typically have a large cost in terms of losing out on efficiency because we are trying to describe a very complex, we're trying to use a very a simple model for a complex world. We then moved over to the option of providing oversight based on some simple representation, which typically in our examples will improve outcomes. But we can do even better if we use a way of explaining the function that is used by the agent here. So say the credit score used by a bank. And if that explanation is not focusing on how that function works on average, but instead focuses specifically of the dimensions that we're particularly concerned about, so focus specifically about uh, on the source of incentive conflict. So what we're quite trying to bring together here is exactly this idea that there is an interest in computer science as well as in policy applications of making machine learning more transparent. Um, but at the same time, there's a lack of connection of that to actual policy objectives. And we're trying to do that by uh, providing a principal agent model to structure that discussion and be more precise about what the aims here should be. So it's kind of a flavor of screening and classic mechanism design. Um, pick, like what information. Exactly. So it's like a question of basically what information do I want to um, do I want to learn about in order to take a well-informed regulatory decision in this case? Yeah. Um, and then empirically, and that I want to make sure that I get to that bit because I think that's really the core of the project, we demonstrate that these things actually matter in actual credit bureau data sets that give us a sense of how big the impacts of that would be if you implemented it um, on real data. And that's based on a cooperation uh, with FinRed Lab in DC, where we also worked with a number of fintech lenders and were advised by some banks about how they actually do these things in practice. So we are trying to pull together a number of literatures here, but I just want to highlight uh, the idea that I think what we're doing here, we're trying to connect a literature um, on in computer science on explainability and transparency, but connecting this to uh, this literature on basically incentive conflicts um, in data-driven decision-making, we were trying to use tools from economics and specifically principal agent theory to apply that to this um, question of explainability and thereby also, of course, contributing to literature that comes more in, in law and economics on how to regulate AI, um, as well as a literature in finance that talks about the regulation um, of banks in these contexts. So it's definitely kind of a more interdisciplinary project than my typical one. So for me, working as an electrician, working on this um, has been fun to actually talk to some banks and do some, some fintechs. Um, but I also think it has a connection to exactly the, the econometrics paper I showed you on Monday, because I'm using the, the same kind of principal agent setup. All right, so um, let me therefore now go into a model and show you what exactly I mean. The way that this talk is structured is basically that I want to show you the general model, but then I'm going to show you the solution that we propose in the simplest possible example to be very transparent about what's going on here. If I have time, I'll show you some general theoretical results. I'm happy to share a draft with you. The reason why um, we haven't updated this draft yet is that we're currently waiting. Uh, we, we still have to get review of um, the empirical exercise here because of the data we use. So therefore, um, the draft doesn't have those results yet. But if you're interested, I can send, send you an early version. Um, I will then show you an empirical implementation where we apply this on a large credit bureau data set. Um, and then in the end, want to put this a bit in discussions around in, in the context of discussions about AI regulation. So let me now answer Isaiah's questions by actually uh, question by actually providing you the concrete setup that I'm thinking about here. So the general setup is that we assume that there is some agent. The agent's uh, choices are prediction function, so some mapping from some covariates to some outcome R. And uh, the agent chooses that to maximize some utility UA. That also depends on the true state of the world. So think of this as also depends on information that I can learn from some training data about who is likely to repay their loan. I assume that this choice is overseen by a principle. That principle um, has some utility that may be different from that of the agent so that there is a basic conflict of interest. And I go into some examples in two slides. And the principle has the power to choose restrictions on the functions 
um, that the agent can choose based on whatever prior information they have about the state of the world. The agent then chooses a function from this restricted class based on learning about the true state of the world. So about this theta here, which I think of as basically getting access to training data. And so, so far, this is just a standard delegation setup. So this setup has been studied in a mechanism design. But what I want to add to that is that I make the assumption that the choice of the agent here cannot be fully um, understood or cannot be fully transmitted to the principal in the sense that the principal cannot observe the full function, but only some explanation of it, which I capture here by basically projection of the complex function into a simpler space. And so some examples for that would be, my main writing example today would be simple proxy models. So I'm using a linear projection of that complex function on some um, simpler space of a few covariates. But you could also think of this as being a description of the complex function in terms of some variable importance measures like Shep values and that describe that complex machine learning model in simple terms or an evaluation at a limited number um, of test points by which I describe what this function is doing. And so within this model, I now kind of want to solve for how does this interaction here work in order to basically answer the questions about optimal policy, which are specifically under which conditions would it make sense that the principle ex ante restricts the lender to simple functions? And now I can give you a precise definition of what that means. Simple function here would mean that the function space I'm restricting you to and can be fully explained. So basically that this mapping from function to explanation is one-to-one. -one. That would be the definition of simple here. Or I leave them unrestricted and then instead choose an explanation. And then the question is going to be which explanation mapping to choose. Of course, in principle, there is a whole continuum between that. Um, for simplicity, and because we think that's the most realistic uh, in terms of applications, we're kind of considering those two separate options as two extremes. But you could also think about, does it sometimes make sense to put some restrictions on the function you use? So you're not allowed to use these variables. But then for the rest, I still want to get an explanation. I think that's very reasonable. But we're trying to focus on kind of um, as simple of a setup here to, to make our point. Okay, Isaiah. So, uh... Just make this so I choose an explanation and then I constrain. Yes, okay, got it. And then I constrain F to satisfy some constraint on the explanation. Exactly. So you, strictly speaking, have two choices. And let me just jump, uh, jump ahead uh, one thing. So originally, nom normally these principal agent models are motivated by some difference in information. And here I'm actually assuming that there isn't necessarily difference in information just because I don't really need it for those results. Instead, I'm basically assuming. It's the agent who has the technology to come up with a really complex function. I may not have the a complex algorithm to come up with it, the complex function. I can only understand something simple. So strictly speaking, there are two choices here that we associate with the principle. One is, how do I restrict you and what kind of explanation do I want from you? And then the second one is, you show me your explanation. I'm saying, oh, I'm okay with that. So basically choosing the value of the explanation or like this set within which the explanation should fall. So those are kind of the two decisions. Um, yeah, sorry. Thank you. So, lots. Oh, what, no. uh, it's just, so in, in the example of Shapley values, mm -hmm. I'm thinking that Shapley's in XAI, what it's called like model agnostic. So in any machine learning algorithm could use Shapley values and you can obtain Shapley values. So any model except that you get an explanation. So should I think that the explanations is going to restrict my set of functions because if that is the case, sh should I think Shapley as an example for this because it doesn't restrict it? So I'm thinking of the explanations being able to apply to any function. So think of these as being like any mapping from, from X to the outcome. And then I create an explanation for that, which is usually like something like, say, a linear proxy model. I could do that for any model in the same way as for Shapley values. What I'm constraining in that case wouldn't be, um, I wouldn't say you're only allowed to use this or that function class, but you would say you can use whatever function, but the Shapley values have to be such that, it, you, you know, so, something that is correlated with uh, gender, for example, doesn't, or that gender isn't an important variable. That would be a restriction. So Shapley values would give you the mapping from the function to some simple description. So say a list of important variables, and then you say, as a regulator, 
I require that you send me your Shapley values, and I don't allow you to use a function for which gender is an important variable when you give out loans. That would be the kind of general structure here. Does that make sense? Anna? Okay. Yeah. Um, so we are still going to evaluate utility by the utility you get from the function that is chosen in the end, not from the explanation, not from the explanation. exactly. So I'm still evaluating utility by the final function that gets chosen. So the impact of the explanation of on utility is indirect through which um, restrictions it provides on those functions. Um, but I should also say, you know, I'm going to go over details in an example. So, Martin? So I'm wondering, being a completely unrestricted, there's yeah. a lot of possibility for rogue people to create this thing. So here's a stupid example. Imagine, uh -huh. imagine I choose function where you can only get the loan that your annual salary is delivered by seven. Mm -hmm. That will almost certainly not show up in the explanation back then because yes. it's too silly. But that would allow me as a lender to basically rule out people and just round up and down a little bit and basically make a choice in my head. I think that's a that's a great point. So I do think this year will only provide some value if you think that you have some information about the source of misalignment. And specifically, if the misalignment isn't arbitrary, but if the misalignment goes in some directions. So one reason why that story I would find implausible is that you would likely want to give those people loans if they likely repay and not loans if they likely don't repay rather than going totally rogue. So it limits my ability to understand whether you are giving them loans just in order to maximize your profit, or you're giving them loans also in order to make sure that you're fair when doing so. And, but I wouldn't expect you to do something totally arbitrary that would be bad for your utility. So I'm leveraging the idea that, they, that I have a utility framework where it's partial alignment in order to rule out that you can go totally rogue. Um, or there's a different way of saying this. If I assume that I'm in a world where utilities are so misaligned that any degree of freedom I give to you uh, would be to my detriment, then that would be the case where my conditions will say that you should um, restrict to a simple function because any, any degree of freedom I give you, you will exploit. But I will argue that if we assume something like a bank just um, basically maximizing profit or minimizing mean squared error for um, credit um, scoring, that then you know, we are largely aligned except for certain directions and those directions we can actually understand pretty well. Um, but I, I, do, I do like your point. Like this is, if I, if I instead took a worst case assumption about what the uh, agent does here, I would likely always say that I should be trans fully transparent. Right. So this is driven by the idea that we assume there's partial alignment. Max? Just uh, two quick questions. So you said this is different from a standard mechanism setting, but it looks to me it's basically like a, a version of a classic moral hazard model in the sense that the partial observability of effort, where is F takes the form of the dual effort here. But so in, in that sense, yeah. kind of a canonical I, I think so, but I mean, it's also a question of now, right? We're designing the information, like we're designing the information that we can learn about it. So I don't think it's a, it's, it's not directly. I, I agree with you. It has an explanation as a choice. So the big choice I'm going to ask uh, ask about is how should we design the explanation? Yeah, that's not right. And there, there's no constraint on that. I'm going to assume that the explanations in my theoretical model will be basically linear projections. So I'm going to like I'm going to say that's which variables should I choose. So that that's what we use in our model. Um, yeah. So so for my theoretical results, so the principal cannot choose to not do that. Um, the principal can choose to well, okay. So the principal could choose to let you do whatever you want by basically just saying, well, just give me some uh, explanation and then I don't constrain it. So that's allowed. Uh, but the, the principal wouldn't be allowed to say, tell me the value of your function at every uh, value of x, because that would be too much information. So it's kind of a way of having an information constraint about how much the principal can learn, by, but still allowing the principal to choose what, what direction that constraint should be in. I think it's going to be much more clear. I, I, I think I'm making a strategic mistake by not showing you what I'm actually doing before. Yes. <laughs> Is it okay if I continue and then I, these are all super productive discussions. Because I'm now going to give you like as simple as possible example of that, where there's going to be a complex world and a simple world. Um, and I want to argue that in that case, um, there are some intuitive, uh, some intuitive structure that the optimal solution has. 
So specifically, I started with this abstract model with an agent choosing a prediction function, a principle overseeing that. I'm not going to make this much more concrete. I'm going to assume that the agent is really a lender who takes a decision of how to score um, credit score uh, credit applicants. And, and um, there's some outcome whether people repay. And I basically want to find a function that is good at predicting whether you repay or not. So specifically, you could think of, I want to get a credit score that models well what your likely probability of repayment is. So in this case, I could use mean squared error and say this would be solved by basically choosing the conditional expectation of repayment given X. But you may also say, well, if I actually want to model um, the profit that I get, I may want to use a richer utility function here. For example, I may want to say, well, I'm asking you to pay some interest rate. So if you repay your loan, so if I use my credit score and I say your credit score is high enough for me to give you the loan, and you repay it, meaning Y equals one, then I get some profit in the form of the um, return that I, that I get from you in the form of some interest that you pay. However, if I give you the credit and you don't repay, then I pay some costs. So that would be the amount of money I lose. That could be I lose it all, or maybe I can still resell it on a secondary market and get some of it back. So both of those would fit within a general framework. Um, for simplicity and to make this tractable with our linear um, explainers, I'm going to focus here on a mean squared error example. You know, we believe that the general structure goes through for other things. And what we do practically is we use the optimal solution for mean squared error, and then we check in the data how well it does at aligning for those more general utility functions. Um, but um, in general, I think it would be interesting to also expand this to more realistic uh, loss functions depending on specific applications. Binary by it's almost the same anyway, right? Um, I mean, Except for the rating by I think here the, the kind of the fact that this here only matters at the threshold, I think changes slightly what's going on here. So you may not care about, but I, I do think in a way the bottom one is also a bit unrealistic because credit scores are used for many things across the whole spectrum of credit scores for which loan terms you give, or you may give different quality of loans for different people. So I do think it's realistic that it matters everywhere. Whether it should be mean squared error or whether it should be a uh, log likelihood, for example, I think that's a bit less clear. We're using mean squared error here because it works very well with um, our linear explainers. All right, and so then I have a regulator, and the regulator oversees that choice, but I assume that that regulator has a different preference. And these preferences are very much um, modeled after what regulatory concerns are in this space of financial underwriting. So one big concern is that the regulator and the firm may have different risk preferences. So here we model this in the following very simple way. We assume that the lender cares about utility on average over all states of the world, but the regulator specifically cares about, um, about utility in the low state of the economy. So the regulator is worried that if the economy goes down and credit scoring decisions are taken based on those credit scores, then suddenly they are not very good anymore at distinguishing people who are likely to repay or not. And that may be a systematic problem. A second one could be that maybe I care about different target populations. So maybe the provider of my algorithm, or maybe the fintech in this case, um, provides an algorithm, or the bank provides an algorithm that works well on the existing stock of customers, but I care particularly about how good credit scores work on new applicants that were traditionally not reached by that bank. Um, and that I have a particular concern about because I'm worried that maybe credit scoring technology doesn't work particularly well for them. But then finally, I may care about disparate impact. So assume there is a majority minority group. So in the context um, of credit underwriting in the US, we are typically particularly um, considering um, racial and ethnic minorities here. So say we have a group of Black and Hispanic applicants. In this case, I may be worried if the credit score is systematically lower for that group. And I may associate a cost or put a constraint. So it's kind of like Grange inversion of putting a constraint on basically how much worse the average credit score of the minority applicants is allowed to be relative to majority applicants. And so what I'm gonna do here today is I'm gonna kind of choose a combination of two simple ones where I can show you a simple example. And specifically using mean squared error and uh, risk preferences here, I will then in the empirical example also show you examples uh, of disparate impact and show how this works out when we regulate disparate impact. So how much would the regulator know about these counterfactual distributions if they had the FSA? 
And do they know this counterfactual distribution of X and Y, for instance? Or? So you're basically asking, does the regulator know X given G equals one and X equals yeah, or three? Or they're giving us a low version, I guess. The, so the I'm gonna, yeah, so in my purple, um, it's actually an interesting question because it's also not clear what the firm typically knows. So in my credit scoring example, I would typically know that the regulator has good information about these conditional distributions. Um, but actually that the firm does not usually have access to minority indicators or is sometimes not allowed to impute them even if they if they could do so pretty well uh, because of regulatory constraints on, on their ability to use uh, functions that either explicitly or implicitly are based on race. But I think that depends a lot on the regulatory constraints. But see, I'm assuming that basically, um, and we can talk about it later when I show you the results, like how much does the regulator actually have to know that basically the regulator has a good understanding of uh, the distributions. So I think adding kind of additional uncertainty from the side of the regulator, uh, it may, may be an interesting extension, but we're trying to capture this in the simplest possible way here. Um, okay, so now I'm coming to the timing and want to be more concrete about what I mean by these complex and simple choices. As, as I said, I'm trying to show you the simplest possible example. So specifically, I'm assuming that the world in all, all its complexity is fully captured by two binary variables, x1 and x2. So the complex world here, therefore, will be a fully interacted linear regression with two variables. Of course, that's like simple from the perspective of us looking at it here, but I want to kind of draw, I, would, I want to have the simplest possible complex function that I can come up with. And that the true probability of repayment is basically a function of those variables. And so specifically, I'm gonna use a stylized example here of saying the bank uses two variables to score. One is, have you defaulted in the past? And the second one is, do you have a home equity line of credit? Which I put here to show off my amazing skills of remembering this acronym. Mm -hmm. um, so a home equity line of credit, I'm, I've chosen specifically because I'm gonna hypothesize that this is a variable that is a positive signal about your ability to repay in a good state of the economy, because it means um, you do have some home equity, but could be a negative sign of your ability to repay in a negative state of the economy, because it also means you already have a loan uh, on that uh, property. So therefore, it's like one of those variables that we may think uh, depends very much on the state of the economy, whether we should see it as a good sign or a bad sign. And so therefore, I'm assuming that that coefficient in front of HELOC, as well as the overall level of repayment here, they may depend on whether the economy is in a good state or in a bad state. Okay, so our goal now is to come up with credit scoring function. So since I only have these two um, binary variables here, I can write the most complex crazy machine learning function as simply as a fully intact linear regression on those two variables, right? And so what I'm now about to show you is a game in which first the regulator can set some rules, rules of the game. So maybe restrict ex ante how complex that function can be and then restrict the explainer, which I'm gonna come back in a moment. Then in the next stage, uh, set restrictions based on limited information about this function here. So for example, say, well, I really don't want you to put too much weight on HELOC or the weight on HELOC has to be say negative and you're not allowed to use a positive weight on that. And then finally, um, in the prediction stage, I assume the lender now learns the data, um, meaning learns that full relationship, learns the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, where we also assume here that learns actually the distribution of alpha across the states of the world, um, and then chooses a credit score subject to the restriction set by the regulator. And so what I'm now going to do is I'm basically first going to explain what are these limitations to the regulator understanding this. And then second, solve this, um, what is the optimal restriction here in, in this simple example? So specifically, the core of our um, exploration of this uh, example today is gonna be that the regulator says, oh, no way I can understand this fully intact linear regression onto variables. Instead, I can only understand a simple linear projection on one of those two covariates. So meaning that if I think of the, the fully complex linear regression here, it's basically um, described by four values. So the four values that this function can take, I could either say, well, I'm only gonna look at the projection onto X1, meaning I only understand the average behavior on this top or bottom part, or I only look at the projection onto X2, meaning you can only distinguish between what happens to applicants in this left part versus in this right part. 
but in both cases it's lossy so I'm losing some information about what the function does and kind of that's kind of think of this is machine learning and this like two simple linear regressions so yeah I'm trying to wonder if I could just try to map this because a practice where super complicated machine learning while well, really, you know it's proper big, big language model for some big neural net uh, yeah uh, and then uh, what would the linear projection uh, what would be the sort of steps that the data might yeah, so I can tell you what we're going to do later. So later, like this year is going to be a boosted tree on 500 variables yeah. in our credit file. Yeah. There's not just 500, but also highly nonlinear. And this year would be a linear regression onto five variables. So I'm going to tell you, you know, I you don't have to tell me uh, everything you think does, but please tell me if you project the predicted values, when you just let, run a linear regression yeah. of what your credit scores are onto those five variables. So on pass default, uh, on age of the applicant uh, and so on, then just report those five coefficients to me. Yeah. Or like, I think if you wanna extend it more generally, it could be report the five most important variables to me according to SHAP and like what the values are, something like that. So that's what I'm thinking about here. And then that linear regression would be based on some data and the data would be some, 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 some the real data uh, or is that what's So I'm I'm here data. just gonna assume basically there is kind of a box that turns uh, these scores into these coefficients. In practice, I would think that this is something that we would do and hold our data, yeah. but we're here crucially actually for doing this, we don't actually need to know whether people have repaid or not. So we can provide these simple descriptions without having access to the actual outcome Y which in practice makes this more realistic. It could also be that I'm the regulator and I tell you, you know, give me evaluations on those uh, points. And then I use that to approximate that simple approximation because I, I won't have to, you know, I, I don't need to know all the details if I just want to be able to pretty well estimate a simple linear projection. So that's what I have in mind here. Yeah. Just to clarify and understand well, listen, and what you explain is going to be the, the bidding yeah. case. So when you said, we only use five variables. You're talking about surrogating the model. It's not retraining a new model, knowing that these are five variables. That are right. I'm, I'm taking the complex model is given. I'm not retraining it with similar variables. So the data, no, no, the, the small model, the projection model. Yeah. Like we're just using the model. We're not using the data anymore. That's right. Okay. And then the banks are going to use the linear model, or they're going to use the complex. They're model? still going to use the complex model. Okay. Like, and like at least like unless I tell them that they're only allowed to use a simple model, they're still going to use a complex model. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. All right, so but now let's talk through what these different um, different cases are. So I'm now looking at this. I've normalized the variables so that things become particularly simple in the representation. So I've basically um, normalized them so they all mean zero and variance one. Um, so I like that they all mean zero. Um, I'm now comparing what would the lender do and what would the regulator do if they just could choose the model they wanted. I mean, in this case, because this is just a simple problem of linear regression, um, on the coefficients of the over risk and uh, the coefficient on this HELOC variable that I introduced, there is a misalignment in what they would want to do. The lender would want to choose the coefficient that works well on average across different states of the economy, but the regulator prefers to use the coefficient that work particularly well in a low state of the economy. On the other hand, they both agree on how they want to deal with past default and interaction because I'm assuming that that doesn't depend on whether the state of the economy is good or bad. Um, and therefore, if we simply uh, let the lender do whatever they want, they would choose a function that just reflects their preference. I mean, they would choose coefficients on alpha and gamma, which represent those coefficients that they prefer. So this is the regression that works well on average. I could do a second thing. I could instead say, no, 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 I'm gonna restrict you to simple explainable functions. So this is set up in a way that pass default is the more important variable, which is realistic in many cases, pass default being one of the most important ones. So in that case, I would likely want to uh, restrict you to only using pass default in order to take your decisions. And now I have a partial alignment but I got full alignment subject to the restriction in the sense that subject to the restriction, I can fully see what you do. So you report all the function that you use now, so I can force you to be conservative about your overall level of risk, but at the cost that this additional information about HELOC as well as the interaction is not used. Now that can be a good thing if you think that the lender would only use it in the wrong direction, or it could be a bad thing, for example, if you think that this interaction term is really important and we could have gained by leaving this in. Yeah. 
So now I'm talking about different ways of restricting you based on information constraints. So, so far I've talked about not doing anything or restricting you to simple function. Now I'm talking about restricting you to complex, uh, sorry, restricting the explanation, but not restricting the function itself. It's yeah. a little bit of a funny distract there, right? Like restricting you to be simple is in some sense something that I don't know based on knowing the simple projection. It's kind of the orthogonal part almost. But it's like in one case you're restricting projection in other case you're restricting the residual of the projection um yeah that's right so this assumes that i can at least check that you use a simple function so i agree with you that it is kind of i'm putting constraints on the opposite like in one case i'm i'm constraining the, the residual to zero but the idea is that i can't restrict the residual arbitrarily so that's how you can understand that but i agree i agree with that view. well it's a bit of flavor of that you ask the genie and you can ask only three questions and they have to answer truthfully. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Or in, I mean, in this case, right, a slight a nesting class would basically be I can I can I can always restrict the projection. Yeah. But then basically I can further restrict the sort of R squared of the true prediction function. That's a good the point. Yeah. Right. And that basically continuously interpolates between. I like that idea. Yes. Yeah. So you you can restrict the rest based on some summary. Yeah. For example, the R squared. Yeah. I mean, R squared is a bit complicated, but like some, or like the variation, say. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe exactly. not R squared, but like something. So, like, like how, possible. like, I restrict this and then I restrict how much you are allowed to use rest. Like the residual variance of the production. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That, that I, I like that. Yeah. All right. So, I'm now going to introduce two different explainers. So, we already saw there's now a choice do I project an X1 or do I project an X2? I'm going to call the X1 explainer the agnostic explainer. Why do we call it agnostic? If you were just to wanting to explain what the function does on average, you would choose a description in terms of X1 because there's most variation with respect to X1. So that's what I think of as the analog of the typical variable importance measures. They ask what are the most important variables for the variation of your function? So I did this here, of course, this is constructed in a way where, yes, I partially align your choice because this allows me to adjust your overall level of risk. However, the way they use the home equity line of credit is not detectable by this um, by, by, by this explainer here, or only a part of it may be detectable as a correlation between those variables, which I assumed away here, meaning that by looking at the world in this way, I'm seeing some of what we care about, but not all of it, because there's something that is invisible to me, which is this additional information. I'm going to contrast this with what I would call a targeted explainer, which here is the explainer that you wouldn't want to use to describe the overall description uh, of the function because it doesn't capture as much of the variation. But here it happens to capture exactly the part that is important for our misalignment. So this part here um, would say, only tell me what you do with HELOC. And if you reject, uh, regress only on HELOC, then of course I can exactly adjust the things that we care about and we may have the misalignment over. Now, that may be unrealistically strong, right? I made this extreme distinction that one variable matters for misalignment and the other doesn't. But the general idea, I think, um, holds true in, and we'll show you empirically as well, that it matters once we describe something complex in a simple way and we lose information, it will matter what we explain in order to get different levels of alignment. And so in this case, this is extreme, right? If I look for the thing that um, may not be the most important variable for average behavior, but it's more important for misalignment, then I can align our choices. While if I uh, look at the one that does uh, well on average, I can only partially do so. So kind of now, this is kind of the, the general connection, right? Like the general machine learning thing, that was my fully complex one. Um, and so once we only describe this in, in simple ways, it kind of matters whether we describe it in one way or the other. So that's the, the kind of general gist, gist of that. Okay, so I have two parts left. I quickly want to flash kind of the general theory to give you guys a sense. And because some of you may be interested in that, but what I then want to end up is more the actual talking through the empirical example, because we calibrated all this to some actual data, which I think is most interesting thing. Sorry to slow you off. Um, Not at all. It, it just in purely statistical terms, it seems that X1 and X2 have exactly the same role in this, in this image. Yeah. Um, but clearly one of them, they, they don't, because we, we, we distinguish them. So here I'm assuming that there's less variation in X2, and that's basically just driven by X1 equally partitions the space. X2 is like um, only cuts off a, a smaller part. So I've chosen this in a way that everything is symmetrical except for that uh, there's less variation in X2 than there is in X1, and therefore you would want to choose the X1 variable. But you could also think that maybe the 
uncertainty you have ex ante about the coefficient of one of them is more important or in general that the variation of that is more important in a more general way than, than just this. But that's that was driving this. So I assumed there was an asymmetry in two ways. One was that there is more variation in X1 than X2. So it may be holding the size of coefficient constant or the, I should say to be precise, the uncertainty about the coefficients constant and uh, maybe the more important one. And second, that I assume that in the preferences, uh, things uh, like in in uh, the bad state of the world, things enter differently. So clearly, like I, this example is like constructed to show this in the most extreme way. Um, so in a way, um, the takeaway here wouldn't be that you know one thing is always great and the other is always bad. But I, but I think it's more to say that. We can construct examples where it matters that we optimize for exactly the right explainer because the one that we may find most intuitive because it preserves most information is not is not the one that works best. Okay, so so X two generally has lower variation, but yeah, in the states the world of the regulator is interested in has higher variation. That... So it's um, it's more important for describing the variation across states. Yes, it's not more important for describing behavior uh, on average, but it's more important for describing behavior across states. Yeah. Well, so you could say like within states, X1 would be important across states. X2 is important. To, we only really care about aligning choices across states and not within states because within states we are fully aligned. So, so if this were a, um, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, no, please. If this, if this were not about the high safety economy, low safety economy, it was about um, disparate impact, yeah. then X2 would be a variable which is correlated with the protective attribute. Yeah, but exactly. There's actually rather quite a lot of variance across the populations. Exactly. So um, it's a great point. So uh, in our same model, if I use the setup from before, I can even show that the targeted explainer there would be choosing the variables that are most related to being able to distinguish between people in different groups, which isn't necessarily the same as finding variables that are most uh, determinative of whether somebody's likely to repay. You could think of in kind of once you have a more elaborate setup in terms of your loss functions, what you would really want to choose is the variables that are important for both, like variables that are likely to be used for credit scoring, but are also likely to be different across different groups. Yeah. While basically, if I just asked you to give me a description of your function based on the most important drivers, it would probably be totally uncontroversial that the five most important drivers would be something that is relatively unrelated to um to say race in this case um and therefore wouldn't really be informative about what i'm worried about here and i'll show you in a few slides that that's going to matter to first order for disparate impact yes yeah. that's just a follow-up why are we talking about disparate impact and disparate treatment it seems to be that even if you if you use a strongly parted proxy and play the role for the decision making that would be more a case of disparate treatment uh, that's a great question. So I'm using the terms here by saying I've already kind of ruled out disparate treatment in the sense I'm not assuming that the functions directly depend on group identity. We can maybe talk about whether you would think that disparate treatment would still be would still apply when there's a strong correlate available. I'm using disparate impact here by the idea that even if there aren't obvious strong correlates, we may, because of different distributions in the X distributions, still overall end up with different level of risk. But I do, I, I, I would be curious about, you know, your feedback afterwards, whether you think I'm using this in exactly the right way, because I think it's a bit, uh, so I, I'm, I'm basically in a world where I've already assumed that the bank can't just directly use um, race um, in, their, in their credit determination. So that in that sense, there's no disparate treatment, but I, I think it then becomes a bit of a continuum. Yeah. Okay, so I, I quickly want to just, um, give an overview of how we approach this uh, in general results, because I think there's one interesting insight here um, that I want to show. So what do we do in a general case? We're kind of assuming that there are misaligned preferences where both of those preferences can be represented by um, expected utility over a distribution of say applicants or in general of instances in our data. So in principle, they can differ in which utility are assigned to an individual decision, as well as in what I think the distribution is. And then we play this delegation game with an explainer constraint, where in general, we're assuming that these explainers are basically linear projections. So that's what's also in our general theory. And then we consider those two policy options of restricting um, to uh, simple linear functions or leaving it totally 
unrestricted. And in the case of restrictions, we consider the design of explainers, which here is the same as which variables in my data should I use in order to construct my linear projection. And so just want to go through the three main cases for which we provide results. The first one may be quite interesting. So assume I'm in a case where all I think is that the distribution of applicants is different, but my utility for each applicant is actually the same. So in this case, if we ignore for the moment that there are also statistical considerations on how to estimate it, if I don't put any restrictions, there's actually no misalignment here. For every person, we want to take the same decisions. Only once I make the decisions, uh, only once I constrain you to use simple functions, does a misalignment arise, because then I have to decide to which subpopulation to guide my function towards. So that would be a case where, you know, we just want to point out that from this point of view here, you would not want to restrict your functions. So the more interesting thing is two ones we call, the first one we call model shift. Model shift means we have the same distribution of applicants, but we have different utilities. So an example for that would be the different risk preferences. I'm assuming different distributions on the outcome. And therefore, my uh, preference, given a person who is the same, will actually be different be be between um, principal and agent because they have different risk preferences. And so I'm just flashing this uh, formula here. I don't want to go into much detail, but I want to give the general intuition of what the main result here is. The main result tells us under which condition it is better to ex anti restrict versus exposed explain. And, and the idea is that whenever it is easier to describe the difference in what the two want, where FA and FP are kind of the preferred credit score of the lender and the regulator, whenever it's easier to describe the difference by a simple linear projection, meaning the residual is small in that description, then it is to describe what the regulator would really want in terms of a simple prediction. Whenever it is easier to describe the misalignment than it is to describe our preferred choice, is it generally better to rely on this explanation rather than an ex-ante restriction? Well, of course, if it would be very easy to implement my preferred choice as a simple model, and it would be very hard to describe the difference in misalignment, then I may prefer to just restrict it to a simple function. But of course, it seems to go back a little bit to the previous discussion, right, of restricting the residual versus the projection. Um, yes, so basically you could think of this as, here I'm restricting the residual, um, and so the loss I get is basically the fact that that residual is not going to track the truth. So I, I have that residual of my, so there's not one to one with the discussion yet, but like, yeah, so in, in this case, I'm restricting the residual that you can choose to zero. So the loss I incur is the difference between the, the simple function and what I would want to have. In the other case, I'm leaving the residual unrestricted um, and I'm only constraining the difference between um, the, the two target functions and in this case, the, the loss I have is basically the loss I get from the misaligned residual um, in, um, that, that I can't fully capture by that. So basically, the residual um, that is going against me in favor of the principal, uh, in favor of the agent against the principal, that um, now incurs some loss to me. Right. And like in any case, the optimal regulation then would be to use a targeted explainer. Like once you set this up, of course, kind of it's not. It, it's clear that the, the optimal explainer is not the one that minimizes overall information, but instead that kind of makes these quantities as small as possible. Um, okay, and then I just wanted to mention, because we just asked the question, what happens with disparate impact? We can explicitly solve for how do these equations look like for disparate impact and what is the optimal explainer? And it turns out with a setup, we can say that distribution preference are a form of model shift where the utility basically has an additional penalty term for differences um, between um, different groups. And the optimal targeted explainer is exactly the best prediction of group identity. So what I want to choose here is those variables that are most important for group identity. And that's driven partly by the fact that we've done this in a linear way here. This makes it simpler. Do a squared here, you would have something a double selection. So you would want to choose those that are important for both. Just just a side note for those of you who are familiar with the literature. Okay, so what I now want to do is I want to take, I think I have another 20 minutes, is that right? I want to take the last 20 minutes to talk to my two empirical implementations. The first is model risk management, exactly mirroring what I just did in the simple example. And the second is gonna be disparate impact. Um, and so in order to do so, I'm now comparing again, the choices of an agent to that of a 
um, regulator where the regulator cares about utility in the bad state of the economy and the agent, which here is played by a bank, uh, cares about overall performance of the credit score. The data set I'm using is a TransUnion credit report data set. So that's one of the data sets that would be used by banks to construct these models, um, in which uh, we take a subsample of 400,000 uh, individuals. And the available information I have here is credit file data, which are around 500 variables that we use in our data, as well as whether they repaid a personal loan that they were given in this data. Now, in order to construct this high versus low, in this risk example, I'm taking a very extreme approach for illustration, um, which is that we have many applicants that have missing outcome data. That's often the case because they were not given a loan. And now I'm assuming that these are cases where I'm varying between the high and low state of the economy. By assuming in the high state of the economy, they would have still repaid their loan, but in the low state, they would have failed to repay it. That's, of course, an extreme assumption in two ways, right? Like the idea that it's zero one is extreme, but also the idea that in the good state of the economy, these people would have repaid it is also extreme. I'm doing that so that we have a, a subset of a high and low state of the economy that isn't just chosen by us in some parametric way, but instead that we're using from the data. But I think that's like somewhat of an extreme way of doing that to showcase um, the toolkit that we have here. So they have missing outcome data because they didn't get credit or it's... So, I mean, we don't really know because we don't see credit applications that were denied directly. But one reason why they may have missing outcome data is that they were denied credit. Um, they all applied for it. So they probably all applied, but they could also probably have applied and then not applied within our window, or they could have applied and then um, could have decided not to take the credit. So I don't, as far as I know, we don't see the differences between that. So there's some, um, yeah, so, so I, we, there's something we have to impute from the data effectively about what exactly happened. Okay, so in order to implement this, we tried out different machine learning predictors here. The one that worked best was a gradient booster tree. Um, so this is a gradient booster tree on around 500 predictors, and for which we now built a prediction function for credit called default. And I should say one uh, graph that I wanted to kind of show you today, but um, this one does considerably better than just running a linear regression on 500 variables. So there's some value in the interactions that these trees find. And so we build a prediction function for credit card default, but we're using different objective functions in doing that. We consider specifically what a lender would want to do and what a regulator would want to do. The lender would want to um, find a prediction function that does well on average over states of the world, where we're assuming that in 80% of cases, we're in a good state, 20% we're in a bad state but the regulator only cares about mean squared error in the bad state. And then to that, we add a lender who also has the same preference as that first lender, but is subject to an audit constraint, meaning that their simple description must agree to whatever the regulator tells them it should agree to. And one thing that we get out of our theory is like we can characterize what this looks like. It turns out that in this case, it means that the regulator would want to constrain the lender to whatever a simple description of their first best would be, or you could even calculate it without being able to calculate a machine learning model, basically just a simple linear model that predicts the outcome and minimizes mean squared error. So those things here happen to be the same thing, but it's not obvious that that's the case in general for like other classes of loss function. Wait, sorry, there was a lot of words, yeah. Yeah, sorry, could, could, you, could you clarify a bit more the, the kind of constraint? So it has to be the case that the final parameter that we get is the one precisely that would minimize in the low state of the economy? Or... So um, the exact constraint would be that I still allow you to run your non-parametric thing. I also force you to run a linear regression on a set of covariates that I give you. Okay. And the coefficients of that linear regression have to be what I like as a regulator. And it turns out that that's equivalent to saying they have to be the same as, as if you had optimized for my loss, like if, if you had chosen a, a prediction function that works in the low state. And this linear regression that you do while you is on the is on y hat. F. It's on the y hat, yeah, on the f of x. Okay. Exactly. So I'm constraining a linear regression on the f of x. Um, and specifically, I'm going to do that in two different ways. I'm going to use linear proxy models on, I have examples for five and 10 variables in this case, where um, 
using either an agnostic explainer, meaning I'm using the variables that are most important for repayment, or I'm using a targeted explainer, which are those that are most indicative of whether somebody has missing data. So most indicative of whether they belong to the group of people um, that would repay in the high state, but not repay in the low state. So we can solve kind of theoretically for the fact that these are theoretically the best explainers here. And practically we run a lasso regression here to basically choose a sparse set, which is an approximation to that optimization problem. So let me talk you through um, these graphs. So basically for the rest of my talk today, I'm basically gonna show you graphs like this. So I'm gonna take some moments to introduce them. Um, here we have high state utility on the right. High state utility would be uh, the negative mean squared error in the high state of the, utility, uh, the economy and low state utility, which would be negative mean squared error in the low state of the utility where those uh, marginal applicants um, are not repaying their loans. And, and within this feasible set, meaning within these solutions that maximize a weighted average between the two states, which is how I drew this Pareto frontier here, the regulator wants to be in a world that just maximizes utility in low state. The, the lender wants to be in a world that kind of maximizes a weighted average that turns out to be, you know, 80, 20 mix in this case, and therefore wants to be like up here. All right, so the question is now, what happens for a number of policy options? First policy option we discussed is, I'm only allowing you to use five variables in a simple linear regression. If you only did that, you would basically uh, get to this lower point here. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good or a bad thing, because now as the regulator, I have the advantage that I can force you to be up here rather than down here. So in that sense, I've improved over the lesser fair solution, where I let you do whatever you want, is I've moved from here, where I didn't constrain you, to up here, where I constrain you to the simple thing, and I've improved a little bit in terms of my utility. But what we were interested in here is whether we can do better than that by finding something intermediate in terms of an explanation. Um, so specifically, I'm now gonna first use an agnostic explainer. So that says, I'm gonna use five variables, the five variables that are most important for the outcome, and you now have to choose from solutions that have the same explanation as the one I like uh, on uh, those five variables, but you otherwise unconstrained. Turns out that here five variables are enough to really make that set that the um, that set that the lender is choosing from much much smaller. And so I end up with a point up here that is clearly preferred to the simple solution here. But then I also argued that I may be able to do better by using a solution um, that uses a targeted. Um, set of variables here actually it doesn't make a big difference and I'll tell you in a moment what it is. So in this case, it maybe makes that a little bit tighter but it actually doesn't really improve regulator um, regulator preferences. And so now you may say, you know, five explainer covariates that's really um, quite uh, few. So we could also do the same and do it with 10. So one interesting thing here is actually that it doesn't make a big difference. So it seems like we're actually already able to capture a lot of alignment with those first five. But at the same time, it's still important uh, for prediction, meaning that with only 10 variables, for example, in linear regression, we don't actually get anywhere close to the non-parameter one. So it's a large gain here from using the machine learning estimator uh, relative to a simple linear regression. Um, and also, which I'm not showing you here, relative to a um, basically complex linear regression. However, it doesn't make, seem to make a big difference. Okay, so this may look a bit disappointing because I showed you this whole thing about the uh, type of the explainer matters. I think here it makes a lot of sense because those people who are likely uh, to have missing data are also likely to have a low repayment probability. So there's, a um, in our eyes, a likely uh, similar structure behind finding people who are likely to have missing data and those who are likely uh, to not be able to repay simply Which because- in case if, if they were just denied credit before. Exactly. So if the bank simply used the same variables to deny them credit, then we would think that explaining the outcome or explaining whether you were denied credit is a very similar exercise. But of course, I wouldn't show you that and give you that whole talk if I didn't also have an example where it makes a bigger difference. And so um, I'm gonna pause here for a moment just if there are any questions about these examples because then we're gonna look at the same for disparate impact. It's a little bit funny to say you should be denied credit because we have credit in the past. Right? Yes, it's true. I, I, think, I think in that case, the risk example is not quite we don't have a good way in the data to do the risk example in a way that we don't impose. Yeah, so it's, this is more methodological. 
I, to be fully transparent, I think one reason why we wanted to do it this way is we, we think that these questions are important, not just for disparate impact, um, but also for many other regulatory concerns. So we want to make sure that we have multiple examples here. But I do think the disparate impact will, will be uh, more informative. Anna? So yeah, I was wondering what happens if we don't work on variants and whether like adding this to the market variant example is that so little information that it makes no difference, but whereas the the piece of information yeah. lies in the first two dimensions. That's a great question. So I think we ran it for like one, two, five, and ten. As far as I know, it kind of, you know, with one or two, it's like too little, but um, I would have to check the, the numbers, whether we ran the final specification with that. But what we tried is kind of, we thought this was a very low number, so we tried 5, 10, and 20, but like 10 to 20, basically, it doesn't make a difference anymore, which I was very surprised by. But it still makes a difference. Like, if you're just thinking about the raw prediction power, it, it, it still makes a difference. So it's kind of seems to be, there seems to be a return to adding many, many variables once you're very um, non-parametric and flexible functional form. But it doesn't seem to be very important for the scouting first order behavior because a lot of the predictive power is kind of spread out among many variables of the interactions. That's our interpretation based on this data set. Did you get to talk to any regulators how they think about the constraints and how they can audit? So we have a big project with Finwork Lab where we talked to uh, regulators uh, as well as fintechs who are trying to provide specific tools. And then we evaluated the tools they're actually using. So I was only tangentially um, involved with that, but I think it, it um, showed some interesting results, including that many of the um, solutions that were more tailored to the problems actually did better. Now, in terms of what the regulatory uh, requirements are, I think there are some existing requirements that are expressed by specific rules and some existing requirements that are described well by just common practice. And I would describe the current state more that there is an attempt to kind of update that rather than that there's already an established way of doing these things. But it's been a lot hinges here rather than on the constraint of what the regulator can potentially ask for in terms of information. I do, I do agree with you. So, I, so I guess it would be interesting to what extent it's realistic or not really. I, I, have no I, I, do, I do agree with you. So the way that I see this as a methodological approach is to say, it may be hard to exactly make precise what nature that information constraint takes. But I do think the broad structure that this is a limited information that is submitted. Okay. And therefore that we have to be very, that kind of for, for in a low dimensional world, right? Like if I run a, a linear regression with a few variables, no matter how you use that later for regulation, for decisions, it's probably the right thing to just report the coefficients on that thing. Now, if you have a very complex underlying function, then suddenly what you want to report, what you want to use in your estimator or how you want to take decisions downstream, the way that you do the first step of summarizing the data will be very influential for your ability to understand it after. And I think that the fact that this is a case for this regulatory oversight, I think plus was an important thing to point out, more so than kind of taking a very strong stance about how in specific jurisdictions that information constraint is structured. We think that this is realistic, not just for the communication between a lender and a regulator, but even within a lender, like some data science team providing a solution, management wanting to make sure that it doesn't produce bad outcomes. Even there, I think we already have concerns like that, where then the question is, is it enough that I report chat values? And our answer would be, so yes, you can improve things a lot by doing something like that, but you should do it in a way that is tailored to the specific question. But could regulators in principle go to banks and say, you just give us a copy of your of your credit scoring model? Um, so I I don't know whether there are constraints in either them having to be able to do so or not being allowed to do so. Um, my sense is that in practice, at least um, there's some concerns about making the full, it, it may not be necessarily in, in this specific context, but there's, there may also be concerns for competitive purposes in making these um, algorithms available fully because they're partly um, compared competitive advantage to the specific firm. Yeah. Um, so in Europe, I know that uh, when the people, you, you know, banks use explanatory models that are global, so models that are like a, a mm -hmm. like they explain the whole model. Um, that sometimes, does, like if it's something like the Shapley values, that sometimes doesn't explain the particular user reason why they got denied the. Um, Long. Um, and I'm wondering in the US, like how, yeah, how, how are people approaching it? Because are they using shabby values? Are they using something that is 
It's like a linear regression where it doesn't matter where you are in the state of uh, like the so I, I can send you the report we wrote about it. So I would say that points to a regulatory requirement that's typically address action notices. So explaining rejections. And there is some, in my eye, in my reading, some uncertainty about whether these variables should be ones that are, for example, actionable or not actionable. So it's not, it doesn't have a, a very easy to formalize uh, criterion for which variables I should choose. That said, we wrote a report about it where we're also analyzing adverse action notices. I'm bracketing this here a little bit because here we're talking about global explanations of the whole, fu whole function. I think a similar uh, thing holds true there, which is you may want to understand what you care about these variables providing you rather than just providing the five most important variables for the individual decision, you probably want to have the five most important variables that are also indicative of whether the data was corrupted or indicative of whether there was some unfairness in the system. But because it's an individual level thing, I find it a bit harder to use our model for it. So could, could we yeah. see the disparate impact application? Yes. Okay. Is that okay? And then we can yeah, talk, we'll talk more about it. Like yeah. Yeah, I would like to show the disparate impact application because I think it's important and because it highlights some um, uh, value. So thanks, Isaiah, for um, nudging me in that direction. So here we are using minority indicators. We don't assume that the banks have that available. And I should also be transparent about the fact that we are restricted by the fact that the credit data sets usually don't include them. So we have to impute them ourselves. And we also oversampling minority applicants in order to ensure that uh, we have substantive representation in our data. Um, now we do the same thing. We build a prediction function where the lender cares about overall mean squared error. The regulator cares about mean squared error plus some cost put on um, disparate impact. And we've calibrated that so that in our uh, preferred most complex model, that gets the disparate impact to close to zero. Um, and then we have a lender who still minimizes mean squared error, but is subject to a simple constraint. So exactly the same setup as before, only that now the agnostic explainer is still the best fit for the outcome, but a targeted explainer is chosen to be most descriptive of differences across, uh, across groups, meaning here we're using a lasso to, to choose that. Okay, so um, in this case, we find that this is the overall Pareto frontier of the trade-off between mean squared error on the right and disparate impact on the top. The regulator now doesn't just wanna be on top, it, it wants to trade those off well, which here uh, corresponds to disparate impact still uh, being somewhat against minority, but not fully because it trades off mean squared error and disparate impact. Yeah. Just yeah. Quickly, um, just, so when you, how did you formalize disparate impact? Was it just so here that's the average uh, credit score of minority versus majority applicants. Ah, okay. So it's not about being denied the loan or... So we, we basically also check what the implications are for the fraction of people denied the loan, which is not necessarily the, the same, because it depends on where exactly I set the threshold. And, and we see a similar pattern, but here I'm reporting basically the average credit score, assuming that credit score might be relevant beyond just whether you're at one specific approval threshold or not. This may also be important for credit terms beyond that. But credit score, I mean, those credit scores might differ between populations, right? So are you now like artificially making them yeah so i'm basically saying i mean we didn't do any we didn't control for any additional covariates but i'm basically saying that the regulator wants the credit scores across um, minority majority applicants to be more similar than um the the lender in this case interesting okay and, and how did you choose the multiplier here because that sort of says how much you're compressing things so exactly so i chose the multiplier so that uh, here i'm getting to close to zero for the complex model Close to zero gap in average credit. Score. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. I think. I mean. Yeah. I think we're almost out of time. So. I mean. I, yeah. I, let's discuss uh, more later. Sure. Yeah. I would say I. I would. I would care if this is a standard approach for the specific application of um, disparate impact in credit scoring in this context. But I. I know that you know we can. Uh, yeah. We should discuss later. So I think the main thing I want to point out here is that if I'm constraining myself to simple models. I end up with a model set that does worse both in mean squared error and disparate impact if we are able to find a good point on this line. But of course, the whole question is whether we are. So the regulator could constrain to a simple function and would end up here, which means quite a substantive um, outcome that is worse in terms of mean squared error, even than the preferred regulator point. And at the same time, also, a point uh, that is um, not preferred in terms of disparate impact of the regulators first 
um, best solution. Um, what I want to point out here that this means that just by being simple doesn't necessarily mean we have less disparate impact, right? The simpler model here actually has considerably, um, uh, so the, the lender model has considerably um, better disparate impact, but for the regulator model here, we see that making it simple also makes the disparate impact worse. And of course, that's because I have a larger budget set on the right here, so it can optimize better. Um, so here's what happens if we use the agnostic constraint, meaning the overall prediction explainer. So this would make the choices constrained of the lender, but actually by not so much. So using the first order explainers of outcomes is not very effective at doing anything about disparate impact because they're important for repayment, but they're not very important for disparate impact. However, if I use a targeted explainer that is optimized for aligning and across disparate impact, I can do considerably better. In this case, um, cut disparate impact uh, by more than half relative to the case where I'm using a regulatory tool that is not specifically built for alignment of disparate impact. And both of those solutions are preferred by the regulator. So this is the indifference line for the regulator relative to their simple solution, but the uh, complex one with the agnostic constraint only a little bit. And the same also still holds true for 10 explainer covariates, but this is basically a similar picture. So I'm at time, so let me maybe um, just uh, quickly conclude here. So I started my talk today with both an opportunity and a challenge. The opportunity was that we are moving to automated rules. In principle, this may make regulation more effective because we can inspect those rules systematically. But at the same time, there's a challenge because the rules are often so complex that we cannot fully deliver on this promise. This happens in a broader context where there is a large call for explainability and transparency and lots of tools that are being built, but that are not necessarily matched to welfare objectives. And so what we did today, we basically put all this in a principal agent framework in order to answer the question how to regulate black box algorithms. And, and we give an answer, which is that there is a trade-off between complexity and oversight that leads to the idea of targeted explainers. Um, and we calibrated this in data to show that there would be excess costs of relying on very simple models because there are often solutions that do better, even if you're not able to fully um, make the underlying algorithms transparent. Um, and so, as I said, there's a new draft. So if you want to get one, um, please email me. And we also have a white paper on some of the policy contexts here that I also contributed to together with FinRec Lab. Um, so that's it for me for today. Thank you. Being a stupid thing, it may just happen. Oh, no, 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 sorry. I like